1983, yes. Uh, Tony Calder and Al Simmons and Stan Rogers had come down from Canada for the Canadian Festival. Uh, uh, the button that year had a Canadian flag and an American flag on, on the face of the button above and below the Kerrville Folk Festival. Myself, Al Simmons, and, and Stan were brought down to Kerrville because Rod from Kerrville had come up to the Winnipeg Folk Festival and seen us perform and decided he really liked us. So, bless his heart, he brought us down and introduced us to the amazing Kerrville Folk Festival. And we, because it was the first time they'd had us, and the first time they'd had Canadians at all at the festival, they had something organized through the Canadian consulate where they came and they took us out to a ranch and they just treated us royally. And we stayed and did some workshops even though the band went back, uh, Stan's band went back. So we were all together at that festival. We did a, we did a workshop on Canadian music and Al Simmons played O Canada with Two Straws. The Stan and his brother just stood up on stage like lumberjacks and just absolutely took this place by storm. It, uh, I, I, their harmonies were perfect, their instrumentation was good, and their, their, their set list was just masterful, and Stan fell in love with this place. They were at the end of a long tour, uh, and this was the last place that they were supposed to play before they flew home. So a number of us, myself, uh, Al and Stan and two women from the festival that were part of the organizing crew and we'd befriended them. They went, we all went out to a restaurant and then went dancing at a Mexican place and I, I bagged off early on that because I was totally wiped. I knew we had something the next morning. And we sat in this little French restaurant and just talked about life. So we had a, you know, a couple of bottles of wine and a beautiful meal at this restaurant. There was not a soul in the restaurant but us. And it was one of those great meals where you sit around a table and have this great meal and some wine and, and there's nobody there so nobody kicks you out. Everybody's just you know, serving you and it's like, and you sit and talk about life and love and all of those things. And he talked about, um, he talked about his wife. It's great, I love this woman. We're, you know, we're finally kind of getting on track. And he talked about his career because he just finished this great tour. He'd sold out in Calgary at the Center of the Arts and his whole US tour he'd sold out basically. And he was just, I mean, to this day, it just puts the shiver on me to think about it. But he sat there, and literally, he, he was talking about how great it was and how he had dreamed of this all his life. And then he knew he'd gotten it. He had reached, he'd sold out, he was playing top halls. This was the, 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 the pinnacle of his success. He says, you know, from now on, it's just going to be more of this. Like, you know, we've struggled, 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 and we finally made it where we're making good money and we're touring and we're playing great halls. And Everybody sold out and major halls in Canada. And literally the line came out, if I die tomorrow, would it be okay? I mean, in retrospect, I mean, at the time, you know, it's one of those things you say and we're talking about it, talking about life and career. We talked about being Canadian and writing and, you know, all of those things came out in the conversation. But in retrospect, the next day, that line just uh, cemented in, in my brain. And... The other thing, the other recollection, so we went on this evening and then we all went dancing in this thing. There were several, there was, you know, there was two women that were out there kind of showing us a good time and they all wanted to go dance with this little club. And finally I said, oh, you know, I went back. They kept on dancing. I don't know where, you know, they, they kept on dancing all night. I think uh, I was just so pooped I went back. And, but we did a little dancing in this Mexican club. Because the thing about Kerrville is they, they try to treat you really well and they really treat, take good care of you. They're not just going to let you sit in your hotel room all alone like, like idiots. We went to the end of the hills, and his brother didn't go. Garnet didn't go. Al and me and Connie and Paisley, and I think the five of us. And we danced, and we ordered his cargo, and played with the word how to see cargo. You know, we just played just silly to the nth degree. You know, it, it was just an incredible night. And he was kind of holding court, and I've thought often about how those events happen and shape themselves as they're meant to be. It wasn't about me sitting there talking. It wasn't about or anybody. It was Stan, and he was surrounded by people who liked and respected him and talking about life and love and marriage and you know, boyfriends and agents and music and the scene and laughing. And it was, it was one of those... Uh, 
golden moments in your life that you get to tr you get to savor even more because of the situation. Yeah, I, I talked to Al, I was talking to Al Simmons about that a while ago. I don't know when we were talking afterwards about what a meal that was and what a last supper kind of thing it was. You know? I forget who had given him a couple of my tapes before he came down here. Benny and Dana Garcia had were big music fans, big fans of Kerrville in the early years. They had lived in Canada and they knew a lot of Canadian folk singers. They like knew Garnet Rogers, they knew Stan Rogers. So when they knew Stan was going to come to the festival, they said, we've got to introduce you to, got to introduce Tim to Stan. They need to meet each other. And he came up to me backstage before he ever went on. He said, I want to sit with you. He says, I want to get more songs from you. And we got to talking and I told him, I said, you are the best I've ever heard out of Canada. And he said, well, which ones? And I said, well, I said, oh, the year was 1778. How I wish I was in Sherbrooke now. When a letter of Mark came from the king. I'm singing his own songs to him. And Tim, at that time, already knew about Stan, and he had, could sing a lot of his songs, and really loved his songs. So it was, as I recall, in the afternoon, and uh, Benny and Dennis said, okay, we're going to, we're going to go get Stan. You're going to, we're going to meet. He says, I want to know what chords you are using for the song Morgan. I said, well, I, they are. It's an unusual chord progression. The car was parked backstage, and that's where the cassettes were. So we had to go there to listen to the cassettes. And Benny and Denna were there, and Tim and me and Stan. And we all kind of squeezed into the stots, and then we sat there for quite a long time listening to Tim's early tapes, which, well, at that time he had several, but he had Vinegar Dust, and he had Sand Spurs, and he had Paw Paws, I think. And uh, Stan was, song after song, he was saying, I love it, I'm going to record it. He particularly liked, as I recall, um, Morgan and Echo of a Train, um, and some of the others I can't remember, but he picked out about five that he was going to take with him home, and he plan to record them. Back in those days, it was two weekends only. And, you know, there wasn't really much of anything going on in the middle of the week, except that uh, uh, Rod had got G&M catering to do a big catfish fry. And that's, these are back in the days when Rod was still doing the fish fry. And uh, Stan said, well, I'm going to stay for the fish fry, and I'll fly back on, uh, I think, Thursday, but stay for that fish fry. And his brother said, no, we're tired. We're going home. And they went ahead and flew home, and Stan rebooked. And he stayed um, when his band flew back to Canada. And it was the festival, festival was 11 days then. And he stayed through the middle, and on Wednesday night there was a big fish fry. And they'd serve fried catfish and hush puppies and coleslaw. It was really good. So he came to the fish fry. Then it was, everybody was talking and the festival was smaller. People didn't swarm the performers all the time when they were out there. And he was having a good time. I went, I got my food and I went over and I sat down in the, the benches just by myself. And after a while, I looked over, and Stan Rogers was sitting in the bench doing sort of the same thing I was, just getting some quiet time. And he was a big guy, and he put his arms out on either side of the bench next to him, and he leaned back, and he looked around the ranch, and he just got this look in his eye that you could see he knew he'd found something, and he just smiled, and he just nodded as he looked around at everyone just doing the fish fry. And he was just sitting by himself, you could see him thinking, yeah, this is it. It was really a cool moment to see. He and Alan Dameron just hit it off, and they they fed off of each other as uh, it was going on. And I know that night after the fish fry, um, there were a whole group that wound up at the crow's nest.
Yeah. Stan came up looking for T-shirts. You know, I told him how great a show he did. Asked him if he was going to be going out in the campgrounds. And he said, no, it, it sounded great, but he he had already, yeah, the van had already carried back his instruments. I said, Stan, don't let that stop you. You're at Kerrville. you got to, if there's any way, get out there. I'll find you an instrument. It's no problem getting a guitar to play here. And he said, well, okay. And so he met me at the T-shirt booth as soon as it was over. And I carried him out into the campgrounds and we went straight to the crow's nest well in those days the crow's nest wasn't up on top of the hill because in those days the crow's nest was wherever a crow would park a van and that year to my recollection the crow's nest was on the ridge above what would become Threadgill but Threadgill of course wasn't there yet as soon as Stan stepped into the circle there Basically, he didn't just take control. We gave him, everyone gave him control. In all the years I'd been to Kerrville, I had never been in a song circle where it wasn't pretty much, a, it, went in the, it went around the circle. But this one time, and I don't think I've seen it happen since, virtually everyone there, it was stand one more. Please, one more. And normally, and I know some people disagree with this, but what we had done at the fire was one person per song all the way around the circle, and if you wanted to sing a second song, you had to wait until it made it all the way around. That was actually self-defense, because I figure I could take anything for four minutes. <laughs> but right. when it got to the end, it was like, no. He's not, he's not going to do this. And he played and played and played. And I remember he, he was singing to the sky. The sky was as clear and beautiful as could be. And it was, I think everybody was mesmerized. I think he was, too. I think he really was sailing through it the evening. And if, if I remember correctly, he did not leave until daylight. Um, because I remember him saying he had to catch a plane, blah, 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 you know, this stuff. So it was a great night. I hadn't slept for a couple of days at that point, so I'm a little still blurry about it, but I do remember going to Crow's Nest that night, even though I was really, really tired, and seeing Stan Rogers play there. And I remember being small on the ground because I was tired and wasn't sitting in a chair. And... Uh, the energy of the circle kept getting better and better every time it'd go around. And he did his final concert at that point. And he was better at it than you and I put together. Okay. I mean, he wanted to be everywhere there was anything going on and be a part of it. And uh, I used to wander at night, wandered a lot at night. And I came up on this group of people and some of them I knew and some of them I didn't. I was standing around by this rather large man and I heard him say something. I recognized the voice because I'd seen his main stage show. Oh, I'm standing next to this guy that everybody's been talking about. And uh, he, he was flying out that next morning. He had a relatively early flight, as I recall, and uh, kept saying, I need to go, I need to go. They're taking me to the airport early in the morning. I got to sleep. Oh, Stan, do another, do another, or listen to this one, or listen. And they just kept, kept getting him to stay and stay. And I, I don't know what time it was, but he stayed way longer than he had ever intended to. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. People drifting in and out, usually drifting in and not drifting out, because it was really good music. I stayed as long as I could, and so I came on back to camp probably at 2 o'clock in the morning and I understand they stayed to face the dawn. Then Stan got transportation to San Antonio and went and made his flight uh, uh, to um, the connections. I don't think he slept that night, but he just had had a magnificent experience in the festival and it was I'll be back and this is, I've got to tell people about what's going on. I walked him down to the mix when he finally said that 
what a wonderful time he had, and he told the whole crew, which included about 20 people, 20 or maybe 30, uh, that just happened to be lucky enough to be there, including Crow Johnson and myself. He said, next year I'm bringing my family. I'm coming back. This is just as good as it gets. I was at the hotel later on. Um, Paisley and I were sharing a room. Well, it was, you know, we, we did. And I got a phone call. It was, I don't know, in, you know, wee hours of the morning. And it was a reporter from UPI, United Press International, which is now defunct. It's just AP now. Um, and she said something silly like, we'd like to get a comment on the person that died after leaving her festival. And I went, what? Who died? You know? Well, I can't release the names of the, of the dead because they haven't released them yet, but I can tell you who all survived on the airplane. She was reading all this manifest of these mm -hmm. people on a particular airplane. They left in four different airplanes, you know, different yeah. times and everything. And I said, ma'am, if you want me to say something, you've got to tell me. And finally she said, Stan Rogers died. And she gave me the details of how he went in and saved other people's lives when smoke took him, you know, when he died in the plane. Uh, she, she gave me those details. I had to plan the next day very carefully. First person to be told was Rod, of course. You know, go up and knock on the door in his house. I thought he was going to fall apart, and he did. You know, and... Uh, next person was Joe Montgomery was head of security then and he was sleeping in the other bunkhouse that wasn't like you know I said there were those which I may be gone now maybe I don't know what I can't tell what buildings want down there anymore um, and there was someone else in the bunkhouse who heard me tell Joe because I knew the security needed to know this before anyone else and that person just fell apart on me I mean it was instant fall apart and at the same time I've got to hold it together you know I've got to get, at that point, we probably had a total of 250, but not all here, mm -hmm. staff. You know, they needed to be told. I held it together that day. We got a call from BBC in England. They wanted a copy of Stan's last recording. Rod approved it. Pedro Gutierrez was doing the sound. He worked on that for hours and he got it down into I don't know it was probably those round things then you know? yeah. and we got that shipped off as whatever the equivalent then was of FedEx now you know to get to him as quickly as we could this was back in the days when um, we had a pre-show show, show uh, 5 o'clock we, we had some group that was coming on at 5 and the music, uh, official music started at 6 and we had 6 sets um, but just about 5 o'clock I was walking up in the theater and Rod waved to me and said can you come back here and Rod told me that Stan had died uh, at that point in time and we were going to have to break it to the uh, to the crowd uh, and, and let people know the rumors were just beginning to fly. <laughs> and what had happened was that the plane that he was flying on developed a fire inside. It did not crash, but it made an emergency landing and the cabin was full of toxic smoke. As I understand it, he had gotten off the plane and went back on the plane. And there's all kinds of poisonous smoke poisonous fumes in the air and we succumbed to the fumes when he went back in to help bring someone else out. And Rod came out and announced that um, Stan had, uh, Stan's plane had gone down and there, the news was is that Stan had not survived the, the downing of the plane and then asked me to come out and say and do something. And I, I said a prayer at that time, and uh, we um, prayed for courage and healing for Stan's family and the grace to 
live in a world where we don't understand why things happen the way they do. And the Canadian flag was lowered to half-mast, and the rest of the, the festival was celebrated with the flags at half-mast. Stan had made such an impact in those uh, four to five days that he'd been here. Mm-hmm. But, they're, um, but they were all too brief. Ah, uh, for just one time, I would take the Northwest Passage to find the hand of Franklin reaching for the Beaufort Sea, tracing one warm line through a land so wide and savage, and make a Northwest Passage to the sea.